So we have completed the discussion of the pressing on to maturity in Hebrews. That's on the books. You can find the playlist on SoundCloud. You can um, see the videos on YouTube as well. Um, and probably it will be on the commentary before too long. Too long. The commentary, I will remind you, is Accuracy Matters. Bible on the interwebs. AccuracyMatters.Bible Well, today we embark on a different study, one that uh, was requested, and not by me or anyone related to me. <laughs> Somebody else requested that I speak about the Bible teaching of support and the finances of the service of God, and so I will do that. Um, and it is really a study that probably is long overdue, something that I think is not being taught well in the churches at all, uh, and probably never has been in our country anyway. Um, we have always been very suspicious of uh, authority and of leaders, and uh, very much a nation that tries to put all the power into the hands of the common man and attack those that take authority, um, you know, until recently. And so that has infiltrated the actual teaching and doctrine of the Lord, which in this case is fairly clear about the matter. And it really shouldn't have anything to do with American um, cultural biases or uh, philosophy. So... We should do what the Bible says. So what does the Bible say about this? That's what this is about. That's why we study as we do. First thing that we'll do is 1 Corinthians 9.13, which tells us to look at the Old Testament, that the law teaches us about this matter, and among others. Don't you know those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. Don't you know, he said, well, at Corinth, it's at least possible there were some Christians there who weren't yet familiar with the law of Moses and did not know. But certainly most of them would have known. And the law is fairly plain about it. So we'll take our cue from this and uh, depart into Leviticus. But what it says is that those employed in the temple service get their food from the temple. And when we say get their food, what do we mean by that? Those who serve at the altar share in its offerings. What do we mean share in and get their food? Is this, you know, extra? Is this snack time? <laughs> Super special on the day that you happen to go and serve the Lord, then you get a special little snack. Hmm. Let's see. Leviticus is where the governing of the offerings is. Uh, Leviticus is the name we gave it, which refers to Levite and the Levites that are serving as priests in the in the in the uh, temple of the Lord, or in this case, in the tent of the Lord. But they called it something different in Hebrew, something along the lines of "and the Lord told Moses," pointing to the idea that God gave Moses these instructions. This is the pattern he was told to follow on the mountain. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we read, When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be as follows. Fine flour, oil on it, frankincense on it. Bring this to Aaron's sons, the priests. So we have a flour that has been ground fine. The grain has been ground into a fine flour. It is poured with oil and with frankincense. That is a something that smells good. Bring it to Aaron's sons, meaning the priesthood of Aaron. The pre, uh, he, rather the offerer, shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all its frankincense, and the priest will burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. All right, so the offering, we have this, fine flour that we have brought, it has oil and it has frankincense. The person who is making the offering takes a handful of it and gives this to the priest. The priest takes and burns that on the altar. 
and it's called a memorial portion. I mean, this is the thing that is the memorial or memorialized on the altar. This is the part of it, the portion that is burned and goes up to heaven in some sense in the smoke. Because it has frank incense, the incense is good. The smell is good. It's a, an incense, a pleasing aroma, if we're speaking frankly about it. And then it says it's a food offering with a pleasing aroma as well. However, the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. So when we bring this grain offering, which is very likely a sack of flour <laughs> with the oil and the frankincense, we take a handful out, that gets burned on the altar, and the rest of the sack goes to Aaron and his sons. They get to have this flour with oil and frankincense in it. And it's most holy, says the Lord, to Moses. Now, did he or didn't he tell Moses to do this? <laughs> right, that's what it comes down to. You see where Korah is coming from in number 16 when he says, Moses and Aaron, you take too much on yourselves. Yeah, well, they're eating the flour. You know, they're getting the food here. So it seems, so it seems. But did the Lord tell them this or not? Did the Lord choose this priesthood or not? Who's decided that this is to be so? Is it by human authority? Leviticus 5, verses 12 and 13. Regarding a, another kind of grain offering, bring it to the priest. The priest takes a handful as memorial, burns this on the altar, on the Lord's food offerings. It's a sin offering in this case. And in this way, the priest makes atonement for the person, for the sin which he's committed in any one of the things listed above, and he'll be forgiven. The remainder shall be for the priest, just as in the grain offering. So even when they brought their grain sin offering, it also was burned in memoriam with the remainder going to the priest. In the seventh chapter of Leviticus, Verses 7 through 10, we read these things. The guilt offering is just like the sin offering in this way. There's one law for them both. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. The priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering that he has offered. But what's the purpose of the skin? Well, you know, if you, if you eat Mexican, you know chicharron is a good thing. <laughs> um, but there's also leather <laughs> all kinds of leather. And it's just saying this portion of the animal that is useful is for the priest. And every grain offering baked in the oven and all prepared on a pan or griddle will belong to the priest who offers it as well. Every grain offering mixed with oil or dry shall be shared equally among all the sons of Aaron. So everything that they make and every, even these things that are you know useful, pleasant, desirable, those are theirs as well. And skipping down to the 30th verse. His own hand shall bring the Lord's food offerings. He shall bring the fat with the breast, the bre so that the breast may be waved as a wave offering before the Lord. Some of them say heave or wave, but the idea meaning that they hold this up in the air. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast, which has been held up in the air, shall be for Aaron and his sons. The right thigh you shall give to the priest as a contribution from the sacrifice of your peace offerings. Whoever among the sons of Aaron offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. So the priest who is making the offering of the animal for you partakes. He gets the right thigh to himself for doing the work. And the breast that is waved and the thigh that is contributed, I have taken from the people of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings. I have given them to Aaron the priest and his sons as a perpetual due from the people of Israel. From here on out, it is due, meaning God expects this, that we give uh, a portion, if we're ancient Israelites, we give 
our contribution or our sacrifices that we bring, our offerings, even our peace offerings, are offered in memorial, but actually the majority of the material is for the priests to consume it. They're in their families. This is the portion of Aaron and his sons from the Lord's food offerings from the day they were presented to serve as priests of the Lord. So when God sent them up as priests and put the priesthood in motion, this is how he did it. That's their portion, meaning their lot or their inheritance or their, you know, their cut, their percentage. From the day they started, the Lord commanded this to be given them by the people of Israel from the day he anointed them. And it is a perpetual due throughout their generations. They're anointed, meaning they have oil on their head. They've been chosen for the service. And because of that, they're dedicated. Because of that dedication, they're being fed in this way. That's a lot of grain. And that's a lot of meat for that matter. But it's clear God commanded that it be done this way. It's their due throughout generations. This is how they eat. So when 1 Corinthians 9 said that those who work the temple get their food from the temple, um, it's not saying if you come in for a shift, you get to eat for free <laughs> while you're on the clock. No, it means that's their job. They do that and they get a living from it. That's where their food comes from. Why do they do that? Because they are not in the field gathering food to eat. They're in the temple getting us forgiven of our sins. <laughs> and that's important. That's worth paying for. But that's the idea. Now, Leviticus chapter 2, we should talk about this. The second point to make is the covenant of salt, which is a curious thing. And there was a very... Uh, popular book about 20 years ago called Salt. Uh, under Penguin, I think it was published. I never read it, actually. I think I have it on the shelf. But anyway, very popular book about, you know, the curious history of salt and how it came to be used as currency and all kinds of things. That's why soldiers are worth their salt, because they were literally apportioned salt as part of their pay. <laughs> and the covenant of salt is brought up in that book. Leviticus Two, though, is where we read about it in the Bible. You shall season all your grain, verse 13 tells us, all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Salt, you know, is preservation and its flavor. It makes things better. Just a little bit of salt in anything. Um... Uh, if you're boiling corn or whatever, just a little bit of salt makes that thing taste more like itself. If you're boiling corn and you put just a little salt in there, you can get it such that you don't taste any salt. The corn just tastes more like corn, tastes better. And that's the idea. It's good for you. It helps. It makes things better. And so when we offer to God, we offer with salt. We don't let the salt of our agreement with him be missing from the offering. We, you know, we offer and we offer, you know, pleasantly. It's the idea. We're, we're glad to do this for God. It, it's, it tastes good. We, it's, it's a pleasant thing, a, a lovely thing, a, a tasty thing. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. He's getting at the idea that, you know, the importance of the service of God. Uh, I was seeing that there's a, a charitable work here in, in the nation addressing um, uh, those who have been put out of their homes by the, the recent storms uh, across the nation. Uh, this, in this charitable work, they provide meals. It's like chefs have come together to ply their trade and provide warm, chef-prepared meals of deliciousness <laughs> for people who could not otherwise eat. And they make it their deal. I was listening to them talk about this. It's very important to them that this be treated like any paying customer, that they do the best job they can of making the most tasty thing they can make 
out of the ingredients that are available to them. And they do this for the people whom they are serving because that to them is, is very important to the well-being, the psyche, the encouragement of the people who are suffering. Interesting talk, whether you agree with them or not, but it reminded me that the salt of our offerings is saying we also place value on the offering to God. It's important to us. And we try to make it a pleasant thing, a good thing. We try to make it as good as we know how to make it when we are offering service to God. That's the meaning of salt from my perspective. But we also have Numbers 18 that I do want to look at if you'll go with me on this. In Numbers 18, uh, it's about 8 through 19, although I'll skip some of these verses. But 8 and 9, the Lord spoke to Aaron, Behold, I've given you charge of the contributions made to me. All the consecrated things of the people of Israel I've given you, or I've given them to you as a portion and to your sons as a perpetual due. So God tells Moses, say this to Aaron. I have given you charge of the contributions made to me. So we're giving to God, not to the priests, right? We're giving to God. And the priests are eating from the offering that was offered to God. Because we're giving it to God, that means it must be the best. And he says, Aaron, I've given you charge of those contributions. I've given them to you as your portion, your sons as well. This will be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every offering of theirs, every grain offering of theirs, every sin offering of theirs, every guilt offering of theirs, which they render to me, will be most holy to you and to your sons. Now we read earlier how that the flower that is not burned is most holy, meaning that it goes to the priests and feeds them. He's saying here the same thing. All these offerings, they are yours. This also is yours. The contribution of their gift, all the wave offerings of the people of Israel, so everything that is held up, I've given them to you, your sons and daughters, with you as a perpetual due. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. So it's all about supporting their family. They have a family. All the best of the oil, the best of the wine and of the grain, the first fruits of what they give to the Lord, I give to you. The first ripe fruits of all that is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, will be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. So yes, we are offering to the Lord, and therefore it must be the best. But when we do so, we are also seeing to it that God is feeding the Levites. Every devoted thing in Israel will be yours. Everything that opens the womb of all flesh, man or beast, which they offer to the Lord, will be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall redeem. The firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. What is redeem? Well, it's pay. You pay. You use money instead. You don't offer human beings. And uh, you don't offer unclean things on the altar. You, you just use money for those things. All the holy contributions, the 19th verse, concludes that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give to you and to your sons and daughters with you a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord for you and for your offspring with you. A covenant of salt, again, it's important and it's pleasant, and it's preservation too. So the offerings have salt in them, and God describes it as his agreement with us has salt. It also is pleasant and preserving. The other thing that it is, is one-tenth. <laughs> A small portion of the whole thing. Now, don't put 10% salt in anything and tell, tell people that I told you to do that. I did not. Tasty though that might be. 
on those pretzels, you know, they got that big old grain of, I can't believe that, but it's so good sometimes. All right, Numbers 18, tithe of the tithe. The, I don't know why the word tithe, I have no idea, but everybody uses it, so I'm just going to leave it there. But it means a tenth, one-tenth, ten percent. Numbers 18, 26, 7, 8, 9. Moreover, speak. Say to the Levites, when you take from the people of Israel the tenth that I have given you from them for your inheritance, Levites, then you will present a contribution from it to the Lord, a tithe of a tithe. So one-tenth of Israel's produce is given to one-twelfth of Israel, the Levites. And then the Levites, for their part, are taking of what they have profited, if you will, working in the temple service and dividing it by ten and giving one-tenth to the Lord. And in this case, as he says, this contribution of yours will be counted to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as though it were the fullness of the winepress. Why as though? As though it were. As though it were the grain of the threshing floor that you don't have because you're a Levite. <laughs> That's where we're going. As though it were the fullness of the winepress from the vineyard that you don't have because you're a Levite. That's what it means. So you also will present a contribution to the Lord from all your tithes, which you receive from the people of Israel. And from it, you shall give the Lord's contribution to Aaron, the high priest. Aha, now that's interesting. Because we as Christians, all of us today are priests, offering up sacrifices of right living to God. But we have a high priest, that is Jesus, and he receives our offerings, right? This is the meaning, is it not? Out of all the gifts that uh, are given and, and go to you, you shall present every contribution due to the Lord. From each, its best part is to be dedicated. Uh, and it says in another place that the priest's offerings are entirely burned. Nobody gets a tenth of what a priest offers, which is already a tenth of what had been offered by somebody else before. That gets burned. When the priest offers a tenth, it's burned. And what is it? It is the very best part. Israel brought their best when they offered to build up the tenth that the Levites have. And now the Levites are combing that tenth down to one tenth and giving that to the Lord. It's the best of the best. All right, so that is the tenth idea. It's interesting to think about this, that one-twelfth uh, <laughs> of Israel is Levi, and they get one-tenth of the country's produce. In, in some sense, that's an interesting thing to think about. Uh, Eleven tribes, if you will, give them one-tenth. So they're getting close to <laughs> what they would have done uh, on their own, right? And the, they also are giving a tenth from what they receive to the Lord God. All right. Numbers 18. I'm your portion. I'm your inheritance. Numbers 18. Verse 20. The Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. To the Levites I've given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. It will be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the people of Israel they shall have no inheritance. The tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. So God is very plain. They don't have the lands. They don't have the inheritance, the portion among the people. That's why they're being provided for. Therefore, which is usually that's why, that's why I've said of them, they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. 
It's not because we're afraid that it will go to their head or they're too powerful or whatever. It's because (laughs) they have been given what they need already. They're receiving the tithe. When people offer to the Lord, they get fed. So they don't need the land in some sense. Of course, that means a lot of questions come up if the people don't offer, doesn't it? What if they don't offer like they should? What if they don't offer at all? Right? Or what if they do offer, but they scan? There's a lot of sand in this bag of flour. Right? Or this animal is diseased. Somebody's going to eat that thing, right? Hmm. Or realize that it's bad and not be able to eat it. It just waste. It just goes, it's loss. Now you think about this. The Levites' well-being, the Levites' you know, very livelihood and health depends on the spiritual health of Israel. Israel... The spiritual health of Israel is what determines their lot in life, whether things go well for them or poorly for them. You see this over and again in the prophets. In that ancient kingdom, that's how things were. And if they're not offering like they should, the priests are not doing very well. That's how it goes. Next question is, what is a tithe anyway? Well, it's a tenth. Yeah, but it's not that simple, right? What what exactly are we talking about here? In Deuteronomy 14, 22 to 27, let's get exact about it. You shall tithe all the yield of your seed that comes from the field every year. So you're gathering a whole field seed every year. 10% of that goes to God. Before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there, meaning wherever the tent is, you shall eat the tithe of your grain, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstborn of your herd and flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And if the way is too long for you, so that you're not able to carry the tithe, then when the Lord your God blesses you, because the place is too far, which the Lord chooses to set his name there. Then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place the Lord your God chooses. Now let's back up for just a moment. They're traveling with one-tenth of whatever they have made in the land. That, that might be animals, it might be grain, whatever it is that they have produced. For a year, 10% of a year's worth of stuff is traveling with them to the tabernacle of the Lord, wherever that might be. And when they get there, they eat the tithe of the grain, the wine, the oil, the firstborn of herd and flock. Meaning that the priest uh, receives this, of course, it's given to him, but the one who's making the sacrifice and his family also partake in in the table there. They also are eating at the time of the sacrifice. One meal, but they all eat together and give thanks to God. And then he goes back on his way and leaves the remainder of 10% of a year's worth with the priest. That's his livelihood. Some say that's the only time they ever ate meat as a rule. I don't know if that's true. It was certainly special, though. We know that. And he says, now, if it's too far to go to get to wherever the tabernacle is from where you are, which might refer to the fact that the land is quite large, which they're not used to, or may refer to distant future when people are far removed from Israel in other countries. But whatever it might be, he says, if you can't get there with grain and livestock and all this stuff intact, then turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and go to the place the Lord chooses. 
Money's portable. If you can't get there with the livestock, then, then sell it. Turn it into money, and that money is going to be offered to God. That's the offering that's given to him. And spend the money for whatever you desire, oxen or sheep, wine, strong drink, whatever your appetite craves, when you get to that place. And eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice, you and your household. So, a little bit of ingenuity, I guess, but fairly straightforward. If for some reason you can't get to the tabernacle, wherever it might be, you can turn these things into money. And that money can be used to obtain what you need when you get there after traveling. And you should not neglect the Levite who is within your towns. He has no portion or inheritance with you. But don't forget, they need support as well. That's all he's saying. Don't neglect. Don't forget. They need help. They need the offerings that you are making. Then Leviticus 27 tells us about this offering. But again, uh, look at what we're talking about. It is... Um, Grain, wine, which is vine, you know, any whatever uh, vineyard you might have, whatever produce, fruit, you know, um, oil, herds and flocks. It's everything that people make, everything that people produce. That's what's being offered to God. A tenth of it is the tithe, right? But then Leviticus 27 tells you what turning it into money means. Leviticus 27, 31, if a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. Redeem means paying the price for it. Um, if somebody is, or if something is going to be sacrificed and he wishes not to sacrifice that thing, he can redeem it, meaning he can pay the valuation. He can pay what it's worth plus a fifth. <laughs> he shall add a fifth. That's 20%, twice the tithe. But you can do that. You can redeem. But when you turn it into money, you know, it has to turn into 120%. You say, but I sold it for 100%. How can I sell it for 120? Well, you have money. You're going to give 20% of its value for turning it into money instead of offering it. Well, but I couldn't offer it. Well, you could. How would things go bad on the way? Yes, I know. Maybe like 20% spoilage, huh? You think? See, the point is that God's not going to get shorted. <laughs> We're going to get shorted. We're not going to short God on his offering. We're going to short us. That's the idea. It isn't God who suffers. It isn't God who goes down. Right? We're the ones who absorb that cost. That's the idea. Now, 2 Chronicles 31, we have an example here with Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the, the, the king, who did very well, did very well, almost as good as Josiah, very close. Josiah was the best. But he reestablished things, he rebuilt things, he brought the worship of God back. And among those things in 2 Chronicles 31 is recorded this in verses 4 through 10. Hezekiah commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and Levites so that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. And that's the simplicity of the arrangement. They can be wholly dedicated to the law. Now, they're not just working in the temple making sacrifices Priests are supposed to teach and they should be out there teaching the law of God so that the people know what is right. They can do this when they know that they will still be able to eat even though they're not out working the fields today. As soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of grain wine, oil, honey, all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah too. So not just 
Judah, but also the Israelites who had uh, glommed on way back when Rehoboam uh, was reigning and Jeroboam split off and made um, a separate kingdom and a separate priesthood. Even the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities also brought in the tithe of cattle and sheep, the tithe of the dedicated things, things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God and laid them in heaps. <laughs> in the third month, they began to pile up the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. That's a lot. That's a lot of stuff. Why heaping it up? Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps and blessed the Lord his people Israel too. And Hezekiah questioned the priests and Levites, why the heaps? <laughs> What's with the heaps, guys? Hey, Zariah, Azariah, chief priest, house of Zadok, answered, Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we have eaten and had enough and have plenty left over. For the Lord has blessed his people such that we have this large amount left. They were so blessed that they couldn't eat it all. He said, we ate, we had enough, we had way more than enough. <laughs> well, they built this into the storehouse. They took it into the storehouses. They did good with these things. But the point being that the people gave gladly. They were so happy to be again in the good graces of God and to be in that covenant of salt with him that they brought freely. They offered to God of their best. And it was so much that the Levites were well taken care of and there was enough to make storage for years to come. Which is an interesting thing. It mattered to them to serve God. They were restored to him. They were right with him. All right. Something for us to think about. So that's the beginning uh, which we came here from 1 Corinthians 9, 13. And uh, I've been on this weird little kick, I guess, where I'm seeing Hebrew poetry in the writings of Paul. And I think I see it again in 1 Corinthians 9, 13. Um, we can, you know, if you're interested in such matters, we can talk about that uh, later. But uh, I think it is the case that Paul's instruction is useful to us when he points us to the law, saying, don't you know that the people who used to work there in the service of the temple were employed in so doing, and that that's how they got their food, meaning that was their livelihood. That's what they ate. That's what their families ate. They didn't have land to work. They didn't have time to work outside of the work of the priests, in making the offerings and teaching the law. Those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings. That's partaking with the family who has just given right there at the moment of the offering, and that's the burnt offering, and you say, well, I'm down for barbecue. Yes, I know. <laughs> it sounds pretty awesome, actually. Um, and I'm sure that they knew this and that it stuck with them the way that barbecue sticks with us. Um, and... You know, that sharing there was special. They share in the sacrificial offerings. Meaning that they ate it. That was their living. That was their portion, their inheritance with God. That's where we start with support. Um, again, this was a request. So hopefully uh, it's useful to you all. Um it's been useful to me, I think, to look again at what the scriptures teach in this matter. It's clear that God intended for uh, there to be a, a bunch of folks whose job, whose purpose is to be dedicated to the work of God. And that in doing that work, they would necessarily be too occupied to provide for their own and, their, and therefore the others who are benefiting from that work are the ones who are providing for him and his own. Um, that's how God set this up and intended for this to be set up. It's interesting to me that a tenth is what they lived on. So the entirety of Levi's tribe lived on a tenth of uh, what was given by the other 11. Um, you think about that and you think, well, what is, does that mean that 
uh, we're looking at a ratio of like 10 to 1. Yeah, that basically it is. Or 11 to 1, right? 10 to 1, 11 to 1, somewhere in there is kind of what it should be. That a person can live when uh, 10 Israelites are supporting that person. A Levite can serve. They can have, they can afford, if you will, to have a priest in the local town when there are 10 contributing to the needs, contributing to the Lord in that place. Which is an interesting thing to think about. And, uh, you know, I am not interested in uh, making any accusations or any attacks on people, but I'm just looking at it and I'm thinking through this like, wow, 10 to 1, really? And you think about how many of the churches have how many more people than 10, but not enough support. That doesn't look like it should. That's a little bit out of kilter, I think, is what's happening there. Just looking at it objectively, that's out of kilter. So I think it's worth looking at this and studying this and learning what is it that we should be doing and what is it that we should be valuing and what is it that God values in this matter? So it's worth thinking about it. But yeah, when we start looking at the place that teaches about this chiefly, 1 Corinthians 9, he refers us to the law. And it occurred to me that, hey, we may not all know the law, so let's go look at that again and see what did that say? Well, this is what it said, and we understand that. It makes sense. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian that you might have forgiveness of sins. The great thing about what they were doing was that the people were being forgiven. They were right with God. They were offering the best of the work of their hands to God. The work that they were doing was valuable every day in the fields. You might be thinking to yourself, you know, uh, I'm out here doing this thing. It's not important in, at work. Uh, you know, my job is not important. It's just whatever it is that I do. Well, okay, it depends on your perspective. Uh, it's true you don't want your job to stress you out so much that you are not doing right by your family or by your God. You know, most of us work at things where nobody dies if we get it wrong. Not everybody does, but most of us do. Okay, so don't let it get out of hand. I understand that. But there is an importance to your daily work because that's the thing that's providing for you the ability to provide for God. That's how you are able to serve the Lord, to provide for the needy, to uh, give to the congregation of God, the work of God, the spread of his word and his mission. Uh, so yes, how you do at your job and how you work does matter. And in some sense is the salt of that covenant. It is affected by this. The, the knowledge that you're working uh, to provide for your own as your service for God, but also to provide for the work of the Lord. So yes, as a Christian, when you become a Christian, you realize that all of your life has been made better by the knowledge of the Son of God. If you are already a Christian, let us pray with you and for you that you might be restored to him if the case is that you have sinned. If in some way you're not living right with God, let's help you with our prayers. If you uh, are not a Christian, we have water here prepared. There's nothing to delay. If you need our prayers or if you need to obey the gospel, please let that need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.